the Human Rights Commissioner at Australian Human Rights Commission, also the supporter of human rights in the Metaverse Day. Please welcome Lorraine Finlay, whose keynote address will emphasize the importance of ensuring that human rights are put at the very heart of the Metaverse and that we prioritize human rights as centered design and regulation. Lorraine leads the Commission's work in various areas, including technology and human rights. Before joining the Commission, Lorraine worked as a lawyer and academic specializing in human rights and public law. Her past roles have included working as a senior human trafficking specialist, in the Australian mission to AESEN, as an academic at Murdoch University, and as a state prosecutor with the office of EPP. Welcome, Lorraine. Take it away, please. Well, thank you so much. And can I just check everybody can hear me okay and I've managed to amplify my voice properly? Yes. Fantastic. That's the first thing that I really wanted to highlight today, that while I am so excited to be here and so excited about where this conversation could go, I'm very aware that I am new to the metaverse. I'm not a technical expert. I'm not a metaverse expert. What I'm really excited about Metaverse Safety Week being able to do is to bring together those of you who are experts in this field, who understand how the technology works and what its potential is, with people like myself, human rights experts, defenders and advocates, so that we can have a conversation about how we can really develop this technology so that it benefits humanity, so that it uplifts us all, and that we protect against some of the risks that it poses. And it's absolutely fitting that we're all here on Human Rights Day having that discussion. So thank you so much for the uh, XR Safety Initiative for organising this and bringing together such an amazing event. While we're in the digital world, I did want to start my remarks today by anchoring myself in the physical world because I'm coming to you today from Canberra, Australia, and I wanted to begin with a customary Australian acknowledgement of the traditional owners and custodians of the lands from which I speak today, not all people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd extend that respect to all First Nations people from whichever physical lands you're joining us today. I am so delighted to be joining you, but I also do recognise that really I'm here today primarily because of the work begun by people who came before me. I'm relatively new in my role as the Australian Human Rights Commissioner, only commencing late last year. But well before I started, the Australian Human Rights Commission has been incredibly interested in the interaction between technology and human rights and fully understands the implications that new and emerging technologies can have for human rights, both in terms of uplifting human rights, but also the risks that they pose. And it was this recognition that led my predecessor, Edward Santo, whose leadership I always acknowledge in this space. It led him to commence the Human Rights and Technology Project, which was a multi-year national groundbreaking project conducted by the Australian Human Rights Commission that culminated in the release late last year of the Human Rights and Technology Final Report. And the reason I think that report is so important to mention is because it really drives all of our continuing work in this area, but it also really affirmed to me the absolute importance of ensuring that we don't just engage in talking about human rights with technology when things go wrong and when we're at crisis point, but that we actually have those conversations right from the beginning and we look at embedding human rights as a normal part of our conversations around how we develop technology to improve humanity. So I'd like to recognise the work that my predecessor did, but also give you my commitment that from the Australian Human Rights Commission perspective, we see this as a core part of our ongoing work a really core cool question that we all need to answer, which is, and if I can move to the first slide here, how do we ensure that technology, and in particular the metaverse, ultimately is used for good and not for evil? 
at the end of the day, the report that we produced acknowledges that technology is absolutely essential. That as we develop technology, it needs to be developed in a way that is safe and that is fair. It acknowledges that we're living in a time of unprecedented technological innovation and advancement. And there's a real need to seize the opportunities that technology presents. But it also recognises that new and emerging technologies can pose really significant risks to our human rights. And not just in the abstract, but can cause real and actual harms to individuals. The metaverse really epitomises this technology or this um, tension. And if I move to the next slide, we have on the one hand the hope and expectations of developers and early adopters for effectively a digitally enabled utopia. But there's a real risk that if this technology is used or misused by organisations or actors to perpetrate human rights, that we could descend very quickly into a digital dystopia. The metaverse could be a uniquely positive technology that really extends what it means to be human. But without human-centred design, development and deployment, it could also become a deeply oppressive technology. It has the potential to facilitate human rights abuses and harm on an unprecedented scale. And it's important to note here that I'm not just talking about instances where this technology can be hijacked by nefarious actors and used for illegitimate purposes. We also need to guard against the legitimate uses by the organisations in charge of the metaverse's digital infrastructure that may lead to unintended outcomes or outcomes that are far from desirable. But before I talk about ensuring that we safeguard the development of the metaverse from those types of abuses, I do think it's really important to take a moment, if I could move to the next slide, to highlight some of those potential benefits. Because often in my role, when we talk about technology and human rights, we focus on the risks and the negatives and the harms. And I think it's really important that we also understand this technology has enormous potential to strengthen human rights, to empower humanity, and to really uplift our ability as individuals to exercise our human rights and reach our potential. And I think those positive effects are limited only by our imagination, whether it be immersive training programs for surgeons, new mediums in the form of living artworks, educational opportunities that were previously inaccessible for people in remote and regional locations, or the ability for people with disabilities to engage in an accessible and inclusive way. This technology is potentially miraculous. The potential for improvement in our lives is immeasurable. And for those of you that are technical experts and that are driving the development of this technology, I can really understand temptation to just see how far it can go. And the excitement of pushing the capabilities of the technology to see what direction it can be taken in, to understand what the limits of it are, and to be the first ones to truly chart what are unknown digital waters. However, I would say that as we race to develop and implement this technology to push its capabilities, it's really important for us not to get caught up in that frenzy of creation, where we become concerned with the question of whether we can do something. We forget to step back and ask the most fundamental question of all, whether in fact we should be doing something. And that's really the key message that I'd like to leave you with today. This developing technology is alluring, it's exciting, it's miraculous, but we need to temper our excitement with a disciplined patience to make sure that we actually stop along the way and think about what impact it will have on people's lives, on their human rights, and how the technology could be misused 
and exploited. So having spoken about some of the benefits, if we go to the next slide, I do want to focus on a number of the risks that are inherent in the technology and start thinking about how we might safeguard the metaverse from developing in a direction that amplifies those risks. And in particular, while there are an enormous number of different risks, for example, the implications of a monopolization of the technology and the need to ensure decentralization, the, the ongoing dilemma of how you balance the importance of free speech versus the obvious need for content moderation, and the risk that the fact that there aren't regulations in the metaverse in the same way that there are in the physical world means that sometimes behaviours we simply wouldn't tolerate in the physical world are apparent and occur in the digital world. Those are all things we need to think about. But what I really wanted to focus on today was how the harvesting of personal information can potentially violate privacy rights on an unimaginable scale. Thinking a little bit about um, online echo chambers and the risks of amplifying hatred and violence. Finally, the need to think about protections, particularly for children and young people in the metaverse. If I could start by thinking about personal information, we you know that traditional forms of social media and digital engagement collect a huge amount of data about people, whether that be from your user mouse clicks or the websites that you visit. But we also know that the immersive nature of the metaverse amplifies this and that the quality and quantity of information collected is far more substantial. Without regulation, organisations may be tempted to monitor, collect, store and sell personal information on an unprecedented level. The everyday user can have their digital location tracked, what they do, who they're with, what they look at. Depending on the technology, be it VR or AR, it's also likely that platforms can and will be able to record a person's posture and gait as they walk, or expressions as they engage. This will allow systems to identify if you're interested in particular content based on, for example, if you slow down when you pass it by, if you speed up and move on more quickly. It may also include how you interact with particular contact. Systems record, for example, what items you engage with, or even when your pupils dilate as you look at a particular item, indicating the level of engagement. The information collected in the metaverse can also be used to create more qualitative profiles about individuals, which might enable organisations access to information about our innermost beings. But also information such as, for example, our political leanings, whether we support particular reforms or oppose particular changes. It's not hard to imagine certain countries or regimes that would be able to use this type of qualitative, qualitative information to profile their citizens for the purposes of control and oppression. The metaverse faces the very real threat of becoming a digital panopticon. It uses biometric data, their facial expressions, their eye movement, their vocal inflections, vital signs are for sale, with terrifying consequences if that sensitive information falls into the wrong hands. The metaverse allows us to engage with an unlimited array of information, to learn more about each other in a way that expands our horizons. But paradoxically, at the same time as it expands our world, it can also limit the world that we engage in. And by this I mean the metaverse has the potential to amplify and encourage the existing phenomenon known as digital echo chambers. This is the second risk that I'd really like to focus on. A digital echo chamber is simply an online environment where a person only encounters information or opinions that reflect their pre-existing worldviews. And this happens because digital technology is unprecedented in the way it allows for personalisation and targeting of information based on profiles 
in the personal information it's already collected from you. These echo chambers have played a role in increasing the availability and amplification of hate speech and violence online. In digital spaces, it becomes increasingly difficult to identify and counter online content, which can incite or encourage human rights abuses. The echo chambers, which are usually powered by AI algorithms utilising harvested data, pose really serious risks to human rights. The same processes that are used for legitimate purposes to target customers, allow personalisation of information and sell products may also be used by certain groups to encourage atrocities and to incite hatred and violence. In the metaverse, where targeted content is seamlessly integrated and harder to identify, metaverse organisations need to be conscious of how their infrastructure, which has legitimate, useful, beneficial purposes, may be misused or manipulated to allow for the dissemination of online misinformation, falsehoods and hate. More concerningly in this space, when these technologies are misused, it isn't just by lone wolves or small groups. We're seeing the rise, for example, of troll farms and the weaponization of misinformation and fake news in ways that was previously unimaginable and that can have devastating impacts on democracies around the world. If we don't take proactive steps now, these technologies could be misused to fracture society and create a vision fueling hate and violence against particularly marginalised groups. The other side of this, and what makes the conversation so difficult, is that while we need to take proactive steps to ensure online safety, we also need to make sure that we harness the opportunities the digital world provides for enhancing free speech, free exchange of ideas. We have to strike that right balance to ensure that while we address risks around online hate and misinformation, we don't at the same time undermine other fundamental rights such as free speech. The bad news is there's no simple or easy answer to this dilemma. But what it reinforces to me is the absolute critical importance that we have an open conversation about these tensions and that we include human rights in the conversation right from the very beginning. The final thing that I wanted to mention is the particular importance of thinking about the rights of children and young people in the metaverse. In the examples I've previously given, I've been implicitly talking about adults engaging in the metaverse. But we also know the importance of the risks that are posed to children and young people by particularly the organisation of data and the unique environment the metaverse provides. And specifically, I'd like to focus here on the gaming industry, which is one of the forerunners in expanding and building upon metaverse technologies whether it be Travis Scott's performance in Fortnite or Walmart land in Roblox. Video games and gaming technologies are well positioned to move forward and develop metaverse technologies and metaverse environments. But if they're not properly regulated, these environments can be used to target children and young people with inappropriate content and to introduce them to ideologies which encourage or actively preach hatred and abuse against others. For example, recreations of the 2019 Christchurch mosque shooting have been found multiple times on the Roblox platform, despite the company's real and active efforts to reduce that content. And I want to be very, very clear here. I am not suggesting for one moment that gaming itself is in any way linked to encouraging violence or extremism. What I'm suggesting is that we need to be aware of the way gaming platforms can be illegitimately used by others to promote violence and extremism. You don't need to guard against the gaming platforms. You need to guard against the inappropriate use of those platforms by others to pursue appropriate and dangerous objectives.
risks and safe, to children's safety and development that the metaverse may pose in other respects. For example, use of virtual currency can cause harmful content to play out in these spaces. It's been reported that children are using their avatars in Roblox to perform lap dances in virtual strip clubs in return for the virtual currency Robux, which they then use to buy cosmetics and accessories for their avatars. In the physical world, we accept that children and young people need additional protections so that they're not exposed to inappropriate content and they're not placed into dangerous environments. Those same requirements should apply in the digital world. The need for safety and protection for children and young people is still apparent. And again, we need to make sure that we're giving children and young people the opportunity to engage in all of the benefits the metaverse offers, but without exposing them to danger and inappropriate content and harms online. The final key risk that I want to mention only briefly relates to how data is utilised, and that's to do with discrimination and the risks of discrimination in the metaverse. I've already discussed how data um, be used for targeted advertising and can be used to help spread hate and violence. But the use of information can also increase examples of more direct discrimination. Louis Rosenberg paints a really stark picture of this when he considers the topic. He considers an example when AR is worn by a user going for a walk. However, due to the wearable technology, as the user walks past other people, they are able to see big glowing bubbles of information above their heads. As with much technology in the metaverse, this could be well-intentioned to allow us to share information about interests and hobbies, which allows us to more easily connect with others and form more meaningful connections. However, Rosenberg also warns of the temptation of organisations introducing a filter onto that AR. That additional layer may show tags about a particular person that are somewhat less wholesome than sharing our hobbies and interests. For example, it could include information that identifies a person as belonging to a particular racial or ethnic group, being of a particular religious faith, or having particular political persuasion. Such filters risk amplifying vision within society and creating direct discrimination as people are able to easily marginalise more identifiable groups. Again, the metaverse has a potential to bring people together and unify them, but paradoxically, it also has the potential to create an entrenched division and barriers. We all need to be alive for the potential for well-intentioned innovations to be misused and to facilitate human rights abuses. Ultimately, Metaverse technologies, in my view, are part of a movement that will see us move towards a more enriched way of living, where artists can create work with new mediums, where diseases can be identified and treated at an earlier stage, where educational opportunities can be delivered to all people in ways that were previously unimaginable, and where people who've otherwise been excluded or marginalised and engage in society in a more accessible and inclusive way. This is potentially miraculous technology. I am genuinely excited, like I'm sure most of you are, about what these emerging technologies can do and how they'll enhance humanity. But I'm also deeply concerned at the same time about how these same technologies could also be used to facilitate social division, to enable regimes to oppress populations, and to expose children to content and ideas that they simply shouldn't be exposed to. We truly stand at a precipice in time. This technology is still in its infancy, and we all have the ability to influence how it develops before it simply becomes too big and too amorphous for us to alter its direction or develop it in a more meaningful way. 
which means that the time is now. If we want these technologies to move us towards a better society, we have to ensure human rights centered design, development, and deployment. We still have a long way to go. Even for those of you who are actual technological experts, unlike me, and I've given that caveat a number of times in this presentation, for those of you that are technical experts, it's still hard to define in a really concrete way exactly what the metaverse will become or what it will look like in its final design. And it's for that reason that the Australian Human Rights Commission firmly believes in making the in making human rights a really important part of the conversation right now from the beginning. The metaverse has the potential to enhance humanity in so many ways, but we need to make a conscious effort to ensure that it develops in a way that is good and not evil. And we need to guard against the very real risks that it presents while making sure we don't lose the benefits that it offers. This is a real challenge, but if I can sum it up in one simple sentence, we need to ensure that human rights are at the very heart of the metaverse. Thank you so much for having me here with you today. I'm hopeful that this is just the start of my engagement with the metaverse, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have today, but also I hope that I can continue that engagement with all of you moving forward, as certainly I look to, and the Australian Human Rights Commission look to, really try to ensure that we enhance and elevate human rights through the metaverse and protect against some of those risks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren, also very much for this amazing leadership that we all absolutely need. And uh, I just, in every word that you spoke today, I sense and feel this urgency to proactively address this. I'm so grateful to you and to the Australian Human Rights Commission for being that voice, being that leader who gives us hope and inspires us and guides us in so many ways. And of course, we are absolutely going to resume this discussion. Uh, if anyone wants to ask the question from the please uh, raise hands. We have enabled the raise hand button. Uh, and you can raise hand and we will put you in. You ask the question. Okay, please go ahead, actually. Um, <clears throat> so my question is, I have an Australian... I'm sorry, oh? Yes. You can come closer. That's fine too. Um, okay. so, so my question is, how does Australia feel that they're oh, it just muted me. Um, how does Australia feel that they're going to be able to stop something like the dark web equivalent in the metaverse from even starting? Um, and in a lot of places it already technically has started, right? Um, if we couldn't control the internet. How do we feel we're going to be able to control the metaverse, which is just one step beyond, uh, you know, being the internet um, and all of the things that encompasses the dark web? It's such a good question, and I wish I had a really easy, simple. about the challenges we face, and we have that conversation right from the start. That's point number one. Point number two is Australia is very aware, and every country should be very aware, that no country can solve this problem on its own. So it does require us to reach beyond national boundaries and to really talk as a global humanity about how we can address some of these issues and to work together to meet those challenges. And I think the third point, which is really important, is we need to learn from what's come before us and learn from the internet and how that developed and think about how we can either translate solutions that did make a difference there into the metaverse or how we can learn from things that didn't work to make sure we do things differently in relation to the metaverse. I think it is an enormous challenge. Um, 
but it's only by having those discussions really early and being really open about the human rights issues that we're facing that we have any chance of addressing those issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so Lorraine, um, I, I know that there might be other questions uh, just in the interest of time. If it's okay, we'll, we'll continue this discussion. I know we'll continue this discussion sometimes behind closed doors, sometimes in public, but the point is very, very simple and you've made it clear we need to remain proactive. We can't ignore the emerging technologies. We have to make that a priority. So thank you again for inspiring us, being here, and thank you so much for supporting this day. Thank you so much for having me. I've really appreciated it and look forward to continuing the conversation. And so with that said, please remember Metaverse Safety Week continues on Monday, December 12th, with a focus on digital culture, arts, and media. And we will keep going till December 15th, Thursday. For each day, there is a different code that you can receive by registering via www.metaversesafetyweek.org and going to Eventbrite once again, thanks to the headliner Meta, helping us all discover revolutionary technologies leading the way in acting with us in business and at home. Thanks to today's track sponsor, Minderu, Minderu Foundation, a philanthropic organization dedicated to taking on tough, persistent issues with the potential to drive massive change and we saw an example of that. Indiru Foundation just declared a fund, a million dollar fund, to fund these innovative technologies and find some of the solutions that we're looking for. Finally, thanks to our key supporters for Human Rights in the Metaverse Track, Australian Human Rights Commission, Republic of Slovenia, Ministry of Economic Development and Technology, Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, and so many other community partners for coming together on this 74th Human Rights Day. See you all on Monday. Thank you.